I'd like to invite you to join me on a little journey to explore some mysteries of color vision, of just how your eyes see color. Now, as part of our everyday experience, color vision is something we normally pretty much take for granted, unless perhaps we're seeing spectral colors of a really neat rainbow, or perhaps a really great sunset, or maybe even when we just need to know what to do at a traffic light. Now, that something is mysterious means that something's going on that we don't understand. And that's certainly true about color vision. There are quite a few mysteries. But today I want to focus on four key mysteries that I hope, hope that as we go through it will help us kind of ferret out just what is happening and maybe get us to a little better understanding of how color vision works. Now, that being said, there does exist a standard and widely accepted theory of color vision known as the Young Helmholtz trichromatic model, or more simply as the three cone model. The concept is that in the photosensitive part of your eye and the retina, there are to be three types of receptors. One that's sensitive to long wavelength red light, one to short or middle wavelength green light, and one to the shortest wavelength blue light. And then by how each type is differentially excited by a given light illuminating the eye, the circuitry of your eye and brain interpolates and decides what the color is that you're seeing. And the origin, the genesis of that theory dates back to a lecture given by one Thomas Young over 200 years ago when he basically said that he couldn't imagine how every single point of the retina of the eye could be sensitive to all possible colors. You got to assume that it must be limited to, say, having three different types, one sensitive to each of the primary colors. But what I want to suggest today is that maybe we can imagine something else. Now, that being said, let's set the stage a bit and talk about the lay of the land, as it were, and the eye and its workings. So here we see a schematic of the human eye in cross-section, oriented where light is coming down from the top, passing through the clear cornea and lens of the front to focus an image of the outside world at the back on the retina, and exciting there photoreceptors whose output signals all gather together and go out through the optic nerve and on to the brain for, for additional processing. In this next view, on the left, you see a look down through the front of the eye into the retina at the back, the way your ophthalmologist sees it when you go in for an eye exam. And this is a normal healthy retina where you see the array of blood vessels nourishing the retina, and that little white disc on the left of that is the head of the optic nerve where all the signals go out. And that dark spot in the center is your place of best vision, the fovea, uh, where we, in this inset on the right, you see a highly magnified microscopic view down into that area of best vision. And all those little dots you see there are the photoreceptors, the detectors of vision as you can see, they're in a closely packed array where these receptors are very small and in, across the entire retina of your eye, there are some 150 million of them. So let's look at the receptors themselves. And you see here a, a drawing of a across of the receptors from the side view. In this orientation, light is coming down from the top, funnels down to the photosensitive, the darker portion, at the very, bo very bottom. Now, as you can see, most of you well know that there are two types of these receptors named after their characteristic shape. There's the so-called rods, which are, operate under dim light conditions 
after dark adaptation and provide only black and white vision. And the other type are the cones, named because of that cone shape, as they tapered down there that operate under only bright light conditions and solely provide our color vision. And this brings us to what I like to signify as our first mystery, is why the cone shape? You have rods and cones, but the color receptors are always conical in shape across a wide range of species, not only only in humans. But that shape has never, reason for that shape has never been really very fully explained, never been connected with their function. So why would nature do that? That was our first mystery, and we want to talk now about three additional mysteries that are related to the dynamic aspects of how color vision work, color in motion, if you will. And the first of these concerns the color yellow. Now there are two different ways to get a yellow color. One is to slice the yellow out of the middle of the visible spectrum, or you can overlap red and green lights, and a mixture of red and green gives you a yellow with the right proportions of red and green that look identical to a pure yellow. That itself is not necessarily so surprising. The three cone theory would say that that's simply because the red and green cones are excited in the same way by the two different ways to make yellow so that the two different colors actually look the same. What is of interest, though, is what happens when you look at these colors dynamically, in motion. And this was done in an experiment over 100 years ago by an American physicist named Herbert E. Ives, where he formed a bar of light that he scanned across the field of view while the observer looked straight ahead, so that the image of that bar was scanned back and forth across the retina, turning on and turning off photoreceptors as it goes by. And what he found was that when in that bar was a compound yellow, a mixture of red and green, it actually split up, split up so that it had a red leading edge and a green trailing edge. That again might not be so surprising. The three cone guys will say that must be because Red cones must be faster than green cones, and so turn on faster, and the green cones turn on later. But if that was true, the same thing must happen with a pure yellow, because it excites the red and green cones the same way. But when he did the experiment with pure yellow, it didn't split up. It stayed pure yellow throughout. Now that fact, that observation, flatly contradicts the three-cone theory and tells you that there must be something wrong with it, something very wrong with it. Now, whenever you get a experimental result in science, especially a surprising one like this, it's necessary to repeat the experiment and verify it. And my group, several years ago when I was at Penn State University, repeated that experiment and we observed the same thing. Compound yellow splits up, pure yellow does not. And we also used that technique of moving colored bars to go a step further and measure the delay of perceiving one color relative to another. It's called chromatic latency. And the results are shown here for two different observers of a delay in seeing a color relative to another. And the fastest color you see is at the red end, and the slowest colors go to shorter and shorter wavelength at the blue end. For two different observers, we have a linear increase delay in time of seeing a color as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, with about 30 milliseconds, 30 thousandths of a second delay in seeing blue relative to red. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot of time, but that time difference is important. We'll call this mystery number three, as it leads into our next mystery, that of subjective colors, of being able to produce color when there is no color. One of the best ways to do this is what's known as a Benham's disc. As you can see it there, it's a half white, half black disc 
with black arcs arrayed on the white half. And what's interesting is what happens when you spin this disk. You'd expect, common sense would tell you that when it would rotate, that those black arcs would blur out into sort of gray circles. In fact, that's not what happens. And you see colors when you move that, spin that arc. And as shown here, when you spin that configuration of the arc clockwise, the arcs on the outside will appear reddish, ones in the middle greenish, and the ones on the inside blue. And if you reverse the rotation, you reverse, reverse the positions of the color. And what's of interest is you get best viewing of this effect when it spins at about 10 times a second. So it takes 100 milliseconds to make one revolution. And at that speed, the time delay between when the arcs that appear blue occur relative to the ones that appear red is about 30 milliseconds. Remember the 30 milliseconds in the chromatic latency. Now, uh, since seeing is believing, uh, I'm going to take a risk here and try to show you this in real time. Give me a second here. All right. I've got here a homemade <laughs> Venom's disc. I got a handheld disc uh, um, drill that I'm going to use to rotate it for you. You might see it with various uh, clarity depending on where you are in the audience and the lighting on this thing and so forth, the speed at which it goes, but you ought to see that they're not gray arcs, gray circles. I'll spin it first clockwise. See some colors? Differences? Remember the color order you're seeing now. I'll reverse the direction. And the positions of those colors should interchange. Yes? Now, this effect has been, is this Benham's top disc was invented over 100 years ago. And, on that, all, and all through that time, that effect has never been explained. There's no explanation of why your eye sees color when there is no color. So how do you make sense of these mysteries? Is it magic? Nah, it's physics. The key is the physics of light propagation in cones. The retinal cones are very small tapered fibers. Essentially, they're optical waveguides. They're so small that light barely fits within them. And as you imagine going down that very small cone, the deeper in it goes, the harder it is for the light to stay in. And what it should look like is shown in this cartoon figure here that I've got up here. Imagine long wavelength red light as big balls green as slightly smaller in proportion to its wavelength, and blue balls the smallest of all, as you sent the combination as white light in from the top, the red light can't fit in first because it's so big. It comes out first. It leaks out. Then progressively shorter wavelengths until only the shortest wavelength, blue light, is left. Does this effect happen? Well, waveguide computations that I have done, I've done the math, tell you it does happen this way. That's the prediction, but it, it, can we prove it? Well, I did another experiment where I took a glass rod, heated it, and drew it out into a ta long taper, basically a cone, <coughs> pardon me, and immersed it in an index matching liquid and sent light down in from the top. And you can see here in this view that as light's coming in, it's leaking out. What's really interesting is what's happening at the very finest, smallest tip of that cone. And I showed that in a microscopic view in the next slide. And you can see there are colors. Red's coming out, then green, then blue. So the effect is there. The cone shape sorts colors. And it turns out that measurements show that the retinal cones of the human eye are just the right dimensions to spread the colors of the visible spectrum along its length. Retinal cones are essentially miniature spectrometers. So can we 
That information is there. Can you do anything with it? Can that color information be detected? Recall that the red information is at the top wide end of the cone, which is nearest the neuronal cell output. And the blue information is at the very bottom end of the cone, furthest away from the cell output. And so color information takes time to travel the cone length. It's a short trip for red, a long trip for blue. And I'm not talking about the propagation speed of light itself, which is infinitesimal. Light travels the length of the cone in picoseconds, but the time for a nerve signal of the detection of that light to travel, which nerve conduction speeds are the order of milliseconds. So you get two things. The cone shape spreads out color information, and the cone length spreads it out in time. It converts color information into a time code. And that explains all four mysteries that we brought up. Number one, the cone shape. That's what does the work in the first place. And the dynamic separation of mixed yellow but not pure yellow means you can't fool the cones. They can tell because that color information is there. And in mystery three, the chromatic latency, that is the exact dispersal in time generated by the cones. And that time code is exactly what we mimicked in mystery number four in the Benham's top. The Benham's top is doing the timing just like the eye would tend to do. So it is possible to imagine, contrary to what Thomas Young said, that each point of the eye could be sensitive to all the possible colors, and that the millions of photosensitive cones in our retinas are each miniature time-coded spectrometers that are enable uh, being able to see all the colors of the rainbow. Thank you. Thank you.